The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. I'll try to get as many people in as possible, so succinct questions and answers, please. Uh, first of all, it's environment, climate change and land reform, and I have grouped questions one and four together. So question number one, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what funding it provides to support programmes that aim to improve air quality. Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government uh, provides £2.5 million of funding annually for three local authority funding schemes. These support air quality monitoring and modelling, implementation of air quality action plan measures, and roadside emissions testing and enforcement of idling legislation. The 2017 programme for government announced the establishment of a new air quality fund to provide additional support to local authorities for transport-related air quality measures in 2018-19, the first year of operation, £400,000 was awarded. Jenny Mara. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Dundee has one bus operator with more than 100 buses that fail to meet the Euro 6 standard. Yet Dundee is expected to have a low emission zone in place by 2020. Given some of our most polluted streets are on main bus routes, can the Minister tell us how much money was awarded to Dundee bus operators in phase two of the Scottish bus emissions abatement retrofit programme to bring their fleets up to the Euro 6 standard and whether a third phase is planned? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, um, as I understand it, uh, the 2018-19 applications are still currently being assessed by Transport Scotland. So uh, there really isn't any further information that I can give in terms of detail uh, in uh, respect of, of, of that. Um, I do know that one bus company um, has applied. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether it's the one that uh, uh, Jenny Mara is referring to. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously, we will have to keep these schemes uh, in mind as we move forward, because the intention is uh, that uh, all four major local authorities will have low emission zones by the end of 2020. Jeremy Balfour, question number four. Thank you, President Officer. To ask for the Scottish Government um, <clears throat> what it is doing to tackle air pollution in Edinburgh. Rosanna Cunningham. The City of Edinburgh Council has produced an action plan containing a number of measures to improve air quality. The Scottish Government is working closely with the Council as it implements the measures contained in the plan and is providing practical and financial assistance to both monitor air quality and support delivery of measures. Uh, as announced in the 2017-18 programme for government, the, low, the Council will establish a low emission zone in Edinburgh by 2020. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in 2015, British Lung Foundation survey of lung patients, 49% of respondents said they bought a diesel car because it was better for the environment, 48% bought it because it was cheaper to run. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what plans the Scottish Government has to invest in schemes that will help private car owners to make cleaner decisions rather than simply charging them to go to work? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, the uh, Government has, uh, I think as the Member uh, will be aware, um, done a great deal of work to ensure that, uh, for example, there is a really good network of electric vehicle charging points which will encourage the uptake of electric vehicles. Uh, um, and to uh, ensure that uh, we begin to see a reduction in the number of those vehicles that contribute to uh, air quality, uh, uh, poor air quality in Scotland. I should say, however, um, that notwithstanding the real issues that there are around air quality, uh, the fact is that the average levels of man-made PM 2.5, which is uh, due mainly to road traffic, uh, has reduced for, by 22% across Scotland between 2010 and 2016. So although there is a very great deal still to do, there is in fact a great deal that has already been done. Supplementary to Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In its stage one report, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee recognised that low emission zones could result in the most polluting vehicles being pushed into neighbouring areas causing increased congestion and air pollution. What analysis has been carried out to identify areas of potential displacement and what support will be provided to affected local authorities? Well, I think the member will be aware that the 
uh, introduction and the management of low emission zones is a matter for the individual local authorities who are uh, progressing them and I would uh, anticipate that this is amongst the kind of information that local authorities will be concerned to ensure uh, does not create bigger problems for themselves but that will be uh, a matter for their management and if the member has a particular low emission zone in question then I would uh, strongly advise him to ensure that he is in contact with that local authority uh, to question what their proposals and what their intentions are. Uh, I know that this could well be a very specific problem for example with Edinburgh uh, because of the situation in Edinburgh but I am absolutely certain that Edinburgh Council is already considering that as well as the other issues that it will have to take on board before it introduces a low emission zone. Question number two, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government how it defines trail hunting in relation to its proposals for legislative changes to fox hunting practices. Marie Goujon. The Scottish Government hasn't yet set out to define trail hunting in legal terms, uh, but I think it might be best helpful if I outline the description of trail hunting that was provided by Lord Bonamy in his review of the Protection of Wild Mammals Act. He said that, he, and he described it as the hunting of a scent laid manually in such a way as best to simulate traditional mounted hunting activity. The trail is laid along the line a fox might take when moving across the countryside. Trail hunters use animal-based scent, primarily fox urine, a scent with which the hounds are familiar and with which it is intended they should remain familiar. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for that reply. Would the Minister be open to looking at drag hunting as an alternative, which uses a pre-laid non-animal chemical scent, such as aniseed oil, which would allow the cultural heritage and social aspects of these countryside activities to continue? Mary Goujon. I thank the member for that question because I announced the government's um, intentions to prevent trail hunting become a, a becoming an established practice in Scotland in January so as to protect animal welfare because I think since we've seen the introduction of that in England and Wales we've seen that trail hunting can sometimes lead to, uh, to hounds uh, killing a fox whether that's by accident um, or whether that's intentional. So I think oh, as we develop these proposals and move forward if the evidence shows that drag hunting doesn't pose a risk to animal welfare, then I would envisage that that is a practice that we may well see fit to continue in Scotland. Supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It's clear that we need to, to end current loopholes in the Wild Mammals Act and avoid any new ones such as trail hunting appearing in Scotland. But does the Minister not accept that the Government's plans for a licensing scheme would allow the use of, allowing the use of more than two dogs risk creating an entirely new loophole for hunters to dodge the band? And will the Minister accept you can't license cruelty and scrap proposals for a licensing scheme? Marie Gouchon. I understand the, the member's concern there, but I mean, I would reiterate what I said during my statement in, in January. I mean, the whole reasoning behind the proposals that I talked about there were so that we could close any loopholes there and not create new ones. And I've openly said that I want to work with members across the chamber when it comes to developing that legislation as we move forward, because that is very intentional what we, what we decide to do. I mean, I talked about licensing, uh, the potential for licensing. Now, what that scheme looks like, we don't know yet because we haven't developed those proposals. But again, I want to work with Colin Smith. I want to work with others across this chamber so that when we bring forward this legislation, uh, we do it right and we don't have those loopholes. Question number three, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what process is in place for it to identify its preferred option for delivering effective environmental governance following Brexit, including functions equivalent to those carried out by the European Commission and European Court. Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government published a consultation paper on 16th February on future environmental principles and governance in Scotland. We're currently engaging with stakeholders and the consultation will close on 11th May. We'll publish an analysis of the consultation responses and develop proposals to bring before Parliament. As the consultation paper makes clear, any proposals for the future must reflect Ministers' accountability to the Scottish Parliament and the role of the courts. Finlay Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. But the expert report would highlight, which highlighted the risk and identified potential options and solutions the government has not provided its view on its preferred option for addressing the environmental governance gap in their recently launched uh, on consultation on environmental principles and governance. So on what basis will it do so following the close of the consultation? 
Rosanna Cunningham. Well, fundamentally, we will do it on the basis of what the consultation itself uh, uh, reveals. I, I, we made a very particular decision in respect of how we designed this consultation, which was not to proceed on the basis of a, a government-preferred uh, 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 scheme that we were consulting on, but uh, rather to actually invite real uh, consultation on where people genuinely thought the governance gaps uh, are. And uh, I note that Wales uh, has followed the same route as we have. Um, we have taken uh, that view as being uh, able to deliver the most appropriate uh, designed response to the governance gaps, which may or may not occur, depending on what may or may not happen in the House of Commons over the next few days. Supplementary, Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's um, comments on the consultation and look forward to hearing the analysis. But doesn't the chaos that we're seeing at Westminster mean that it's going to be very difficult for us to identify what these governance gaps are? Rosanna well, Cunningham. Uh, as, as I did kind of refer to briefly at the end of my uh, um, uh, previous response, um, it is very hard to make plans uh, in the face of uh, the uncertainty in Westminster. Um, it, it is, however, vital to ensure that there does remain in place effective and appropriate governance to monitor and enforce environmental standards uh, in Scotland. For obvious reasons, I think, as everybody would be expecting me to say, my choice would be to remain fully within the EU governance systems. Um, we're trying to prepare for whatever the future brings. Um, and at the moment, we really do not know what governance system might or might not apply, even if there was to be a deal which we also do not know. Question number five, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to possible exemptions for a deposit return scheme. Rosanna Cunningham. Work is ongoing to finalise the preferred design for a Scottish deposit return scheme in line with the commitment contained in the 2018-19 programme for government. And in doing so, we are giving careful consideration to the views expressed by the more than 3,000 individuals and organisations across the country who did respond to the public consultation on proposals. We recognise the need for any scheme to properly take into account the interests of retailers, whilst also reflecting the needs of members of the public across the country who will require convenient access to return points if the scheme is to be a success. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and I know she's very well aware of some of the concerns around this and some of the discussion amongst the business uh, community about whether there will be any forms of exemptions. Could I ask her um, whether she is actively discussing what these exemptions uh, might be? Rosanna Cunningham. Well there is an active uh, discussion about all aspects of a proposed uh, deposit uh, return uh, scheme. Um, there are uh, some exemption proposals being put forward by some organisations and, uh, uh, and the member is right to say that you know, these conversations with these organisations have been going on now for some considerable time, stretching back indeed for some years. Um, but I think that uh, there, is, there is a degree of uh, um, uh, wariness that, that I, I would ask members to have about them when they're thinking and listening to some of what's said. Uh, I know that that the, it, the request, for example, that exemptions should be applied to uh, uh, shops with floor spaces under 280 square metres, which is one of the asks that we're receiving, would effectively exempt all but 17% of the premises in Scotland. And that would create some very significant issues uh, in terms of accessibility and potential success of any scheme. So it isn't simply as straightforward, I think, as some members would like to imagine. Uh, it would potentially leave huge geographic areas without a return point. So these are the kinds of things that we have to balance, we have to think about, we have to take on board, uh, and we are doing so. Supplementary, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is about small urban as well as rural retailers, and not necessarily uh, about exemptions, a point that she has already touched on, but might be about support for good arrangements such as both she and I saw last summer on our visits to Norway? And will this be considered by the new advisory group? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, the new advisory group has not actually formally met yet, so uh, I would expect that uh, all of this will be part of their consideration. I uh, fully anticipate mm -hmm. uh, that all potential solutions uh, to the problems and the challenges 
that introducing a new scheme will bring uh, will be uh, part and parcel of the conversation. But, uh, you know, I need to remind everybody in the chamber that we're not kind of, in a sense, out here on our own in this. There are a huge number of other countries across the whole of Europe who have deposit return schemes of one kind or another actively and successfully working. And we should be able to do exactly the same as that. Question six was not lodged. Question number seven, Myrtle Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to alleviate fly tipping. Rosanna Cunningham. <laughs> Local authorities are primarily responsible for clearing fly tipping and litter, uh, which of course fly tipping is illegal, dangerous and unnecessary. Valuable resources which could be recycled are wasted. Publicly funded organisations and landowners bear the cost of the cleanup. To tackle this, we support the reporting of fly tipping using Fly Mapper and Dumb Dumpers and the wider work of Zero Waste Scotland, SEPA and the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime on prevention and sharing expertise. We've provided SEPA and local authorities with the powers to find people who are caught at fly tipping with a minimum fixed penalty of £200 up to a maximum fine of 40000 if prosecuted. Martin Fraser. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that comprehensive response? Fly tipping seems to be a growing problem. For example, in, in Perth and Kinross, recorded incidents have doubled in the last four years. The, the current law in this area means that it is the owner of the land who is responsible for the cost of cleaning up uh, fly tipping, which goes against the polluter pay, pays principle. Is it not time to revisit this law so that the owners of land are not held liable for the irresponsible actions of other people? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I think I would need to see a, a, great, meal, a great deal more uh, detailed analysis of what actually um, happens in respect of fly tipping to be, to be certain that changing the law would actually uh, help the situation. Um, it is a considerable problem um, and it is unfortunately a, a problem which uh, is, I suspect, growing. Um, however, at the end of the day, the responsibility uh, will lie with the individuals who are doing the fly tipping, ideally if we could identify who, the, who those were, uh, we would be able to do so. Uh, in the absence of that, it, it is indeed the landowner who is currently responsible. A quick supplementary please from David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how it encourages a preventive approach to reducing litter? Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, there's a national litter strategy towards a litter-free Scotland which sets out a strategic approach to prevent littering. It focuses on a range of approaches, but key to this is the underpinning message about the waste of time and money to clear litter and the environmental harm of littering to our communities, countryside and marine environment. So we continue to look to new ways to reduce littering. Uh, and this is why today I've announced our intention to introduce a new offence of littering from vehicles that will help to target the blight of roadside litter that we see in Scotland. Question number eight, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to consult on the outstanding special marine protected areas. Marie Gushel. The Scottish Government is currently in the process of preparing consultations in two areas, both of which could be covered by this question. Firstly, there's a supplementary consultation on the strategic environmental assessment for the classification of special areas of protection for seabirds. And secondly, there's a consultation on the designation of four additional nature conservation marine protected areas for mobile species. Both of these consultations will be launched shortly after the Easter recess. But we also at the moment have a consultation on two new historic marine protected areas, one at Bressey Sound and the other at Scapa Flow. And this consultation is open and will run until the 17th of April. Pauline McNeill. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I would like the Minister to clarify that that would include a consultation on massive deep water marine protected areas. And as she will know, that Rockall Basin will single-handedly double the size of the marine protection network. Uh, can, the, uh, can the Minister also assure me that the consultation will be well underway? We can see the conclusions that might take place before the end of this parliamentary session. Mary Gushel. That would certainly be the intention with the consultations being launched in the Easter recess. And that's the thing, we want to make sure that we have as, as wide an engagement as possible. Um, I'll probably have to catch the member again when it comes to the first point of that question. I picked up, I mean, we do have proposals for uh, a, deep, a deep sea reserve. Uh, I don't know if that's what the first point was in relation to, but I'd happily catch up with the member and write to her with more details on that. 
I'm going to move on now to questions on the rural economy, if people could change their seating quickly. Question number one, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made since January uh, the 10th, 2019, the setting up of the food and farm, uh, the, sorry, the farming and food production policy group. Fergus Ewing. Presiding Officer, the remit and membership of the farming and food production group is under active consideration and details will be confirmed in due course. As indicated during the subsequent 6th of March parliamentary debate, Scottish ministers are committed to establishing the group in a way that reflects the wishes of Parliament and membership will include representation of farmers, environmental organisations and consumers. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And would the Cabinet Secretary commit today to a time frame for progressing this uh, group in more detail, as well as the group's deliberations and outputs? And will he co collaboratively um, with MSPs across the chamber, given the parliamentary appetite for such a group, work with all who are interested? Fergus um, Ewing. Well, well I, I don't want to, to commit to a specific timetable. I can assure the member and, and all members across the chamber that active consideration is being given uh, to the composition of this group. It's a very important piece of work that uh, Parliament wishes us to do. Uh, and of course, I'm always happy to take into account the views of members across the, the parliamentary chamber, but I do have a remit from Parliament and I intend to fulfil uh, that, that remit and to do so, uh, Claudia Beamish, as soon as I possibly can. But uh, I tend to find that imposing a, a deadlines upon oneself is perhaps not a prudent ministerial practice. I have short supplementaries, please, from Gillian Martin and then Donald Cameron. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that farmers and food producers are playing their part to help reduce emissions, given the many analyses suggesting that significant action is needed to tackle emissions from agriculture? Fergus Ewing. Well, yes, uh, yes, I'm happy to, to answer that question. We want Scotland to be a world-class producer of high-quality food. We believe we are uh, producing that food sustainably profitably and efficiently. The agricultural chapter of the Climate Change Plan, presiding officer, sets out our approach and we're working with the industry and also our institutes, our renowned scientific community who contribute so much in this area. We have reinforced our intentions with three commitments in the 2018-19 program for government. We've delivered on our young farmer climate change champions. We're on target to deliver on the commitments regarding nitrogen modeling tools uh, and farming for a better climate. Donald Cameron. Thank you. Can I refer to farming in my register of interest? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware from recent Scottish farm business income is estimates that while average farm income has risen, too many farms are still making average losses of £7,400. What support in terms of food production can the Scottish Government provide to farms now to help them diversify in order to become more financially sustainable? Fergus Ewing. Well, I, I think Mr. Cameron is, is, is right to, to make that point, and indeed I, I met uh, with him with some farmers from Loch Arbor just a few weeks ago, and I'm acutely aware that many farmers, particularly in hill farm areas in the, the highlands, in, in the islands, uh, but in many Elfast areas, face acute financial pressures. Um, and that's why we have worked very hard, um, Mr. Cameron, that to deliver uh, loan payments in the basic payments scheme uh, in starting in October last year, ahead two months ahead of most of the rest of the UK, and the LFAS scheme in March, uh, and most of the LFAS loan payments have uh, been made. So, you know, my main job is to get that financial support, presiding officer, out the door into the hands of farmers and crofters. We have, pra in practical terms, succeeded in that, and I'm acutely aware that with the pressures of Brexit and the fear of the unknown about what that may lead, that that's a very important piece of work. And I can assure Mr. Cameron and other members that that has my daily attention with weekly conference calls, including this morning, with officials to make sure that Team Scotland is on the case, and I believe we have been and are. 
Question number two, Ruth Maguire. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what, impact, what assessment it has made of the impact that leaving the EU will have on the food and drink industry. Mary Gushon. If the UK leaves the EU without a deal on the 12th of April, Scotland would experience substantial disruptive impacts across the food and drink sector and those who supply this absolutely vital sector. And the highest risks in the immediate term uh, are as a consequence of significant disruption to the flow of goods across the channel. And that would be in particular in relation to our seafood sector, which accounts for 58% of our overall food exports. Uh, they would be likely to be affected uh, given the just-in-time and perishable nature of this trade. Uh, but I think it's also worthwhile to note, I mean, as James Withers of Scotland Food and Drink has stated, this would also be expected to cost us in the region of £2 billion to our food and drink sector, a cost that we can ill afford. Ruth Maguire. Thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister advise if the Scottish Government initiative to support businesses affected by Brexit is open to the food and drink companies and how might companies in my Cunningham South constituency access this funding? Mary Gouchon. I thank the member for that question and I can confirm that food and drink uh, businesses can apply for that. Um, and the initiative that we have to support businesses is being promoted through our enterprise agencies who have produced a self-assessment toolkit and a checklist with access to events and expert advice and that can be found at www.prepareforbrexit.scot. Now the Brexit support grant provides 100% funding, uh, a minimum of £2,000 to a maximum of £4,000 pounds to help VAT registered SMEs manage a wide range of Brexit impacts. Information about this scheme has been placed in SPICE and I really would encourage all members around the Chamber to make relevant businesses in their constituencies aware of the grant as well as the Brexit self-assessment tool toolkit. Supplementary from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A significant, a significant amount of Scottish lamb is exported to the EU, and I wonder what um, the Minister is going to do to support uh, sheep farmers in Scotland, either on a, the, the, if there is a no deal Brexit or indeed if, if we end up in a backstop situation. Mary Gouchon. I thank Rhoda Grant for raising that question because we identified sheep meat as one of the areas which would be probably worst affected, especially by a no deal Brexit. But together with the Cabinet Secretary, we've attended the Scottish Government Resilience Committees. On top of that, we have the Food Sector Resilience Group meetings as well, uh, which has been a fortnightly meeting with uh, all sectors right across the industry to try and establish exactly what all the issues are and what contingency measures we can put in place uh, to try and, and help uh, prevent against that, that worst case scenario that we could that we could well be be within. I think the, the point to bear in mind though is that we don't have all of this within our control in Scotland but it's trying to mitigate against the worst impacts uh, as far as possible and really working as closely with industry as we can to prevent against some of those worst impacts. Question number three, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what impact Brexit could have on the agriculture sector in Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire. Fergus Ewing. Uh, leaving the EU will significantly impact on agriculture across Scotland, including Mr Arthur's constituency, particularly in a no-deal scenario. The Scottish Government recently published a list of 67 known negative impacts of Brexit across the rural economy, many affecting farming and food production. Analysis shows that defaulting to uh, WTO terms could be severe for some sectors. For example, the farm gate price for sheep meat could fall by up to 30%. But the loss of people is potentially the most significant issue. Food Standards Scotland estimates that around 75% of vets currently working in our abattoirs are non-UK EU nationals. If we were to lose this skilled workforce, presiding officer, we would have serious difficulties in providing meat for domestic consumers as well as for export. Tom Arthur. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed and sobering answer. Given that the UK government has failed to guarantee future funding for farm support beyond the end of the current UK Parliament scheduled for 2022, can the Cabinet Secretary advise what he is doing to ensure farmers and food producers get their payment entitlements this year to help address the stress being caused by ongoing Brexit uncertainty? Fergus Hume. Who would put money on the UK Parliament lasting until the end of 2022, presiding officer? The guarantee may expire somewhat sooner than that. But we're doing what we can. We've operated two successful loan schemes. 
for basic payments 218 and LFAS 218 directly putting 370 million into rural businesses. We have commenced basic payment, basic payment balance payments in March and I'm pleased to confirm today that payments made under the 2018 Scottish Suckler Beef Support Scheme are being processed this week and will begin to reach bank accounts from the 9th of April next Tuesday. I expect that initial round of payments worth an estimated 33 million will be processed with work in hand to make the remainder of the payments between now and the end of the payment window in June. I can also confirm that we will begin to process LFAS 218 scheme payments next week. This means we will be closing the LFAS loan scheme on the 12th of April. The 12th of April, that's next Friday, presiding officer, and anyone who still wishes to accept a loan offer uh, should reply by that date. So far, we have paid out LFAS 2018 loans worth 51.7 million to 8,379 claimants, which is in line with our experience of previous loan schemes. Question number four, Liam Kerr. You asked the Scottish Government when it last met NFU Scotland and what was discussed. Fergus Ewing. Uh, I met with NFUS on 21st of March and my colleague Rosanna Cunningham also met the NFUS on that date and we meet officials and office bearers regularly. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Farmers in the North East have been impacted by record levels of fly tipping and as Myrtle Fraser highlighted earlier, the burden of clean up falls on the farmer on pain of being fined. So what will the Scottish Government do to support farmers in this region respond to fly tipping? And given that just one in 600 cases in Aberdeenshire results in conviction, does he agree the law needs strengthened? Fergus Ewing. Well, I believe this matter is, is actually one that's dealt with by my colleague, Rosanna Cunningham, and it was raised in, indeed, the immediately preceding portfolio questions. But, uh, but that said, I entirely agree that this is an extremely serious matter. Uh, fly tipping is... Uh, is a, a form of criminal activity. It is selfish. It has a huge impact on farmers. People that do it should be, frankly, ashamed of themselves. And I hope that those who do do it uh, are caught. The difficulty, of course, as the member knows, is uh, the evidential requirement. Uh, and that is a difficult matter, particularly in rural Scotland, where there tends to be a lack of eyewitnesses to such behaviour. But I have no hesitation in condemning that behaviour. Uh, and uh, I also know that the police, uh, and I've re recently had meetings with the police in relation to rural crime, uh, take these matters very seriously, indeed, and rightly so. Supplementary, Liam McCarthy. Thank you very much. As the Cabinet Secretary be aware, uh, NFUS have expressed serious concerns over the increasing uh, numbers of migrant greylag gray geese uh, affecting a number of uh, communities around the country, including uh, Orkney. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary therefore um, uh, lend his support to efforts to get SNH, the NFU and other partners uh, to look at ways of extending the adaptive management um, scheme programmes so that this uh, issue can be dealt with more effectively going forward? Fair to show. Uh, well, again, I think this is a matter specifically within the portfolio responsibility of my colleague, Rosanna Cunningham, but I am aware of these matters. I, I followed the recent publicity about the burgeoning numbers of grey lag geese and the fact that this is a serious issue for Mr. MacArthur's farmers. Indeed, I did meet several of them in a visit in the not too distant past, and I respect the great work that Orcadian farmers do and the high quality of the produce that they provide Scotland with. And therefore, I would have no hesitation in agreeing that we should encourage all parties, including SNH, uh, to see if a solution can be found to this, this issue that is congenial to Mr. MacArthur's constituents. Question number five, Bill Bowman. The Scottish Government, what discussions it has had with fishermen in Angus regarding the impact of offshore wind developments on the fishing industry. The Scottish Government officials regularly discuss immediate and strategic issues relating to the impact of offshore wind developments with fishermen and their representative organisations, including those from Angus. This includes discussions on projects that are going through the consenting and post-consent construction process, as well as the sectoral marine plan for offshore wind, where fisheries representatives sit on the cross-sectoral steering groups for this work. My officials are currently undertaking a review of consenting instruments in order to ensure that adequate mitigation is in place to protect the fishing sector. Marine Scotland have actively sought views from the fishing industry and would welcome any further input from fishers and their representative organisations. 
Bill Bowman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Arbroath and Angus had thriving fishing industries prior to the implementation of the Common Fisheries Policy, and I welcome the sea of opportunity that leaving the CFP will afford my constituents. So, for after leaving the CFP, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what assessment has been made of the impact that the increasing number of offshore wind structures will have on the increased number of fishing vessels? Fairfishing. Uh, I'm not quite sure what, what causal link there is be, between the two topics that the member raises, but sticking to the topic that was raised in the question, which I, I thought was the appropriate process we're engaged in here, I'm very happy to say that we take extremely seriously <laughs> the protection of fisheries interests while we pursue our renewable energy ambitions successfully. I've taken a personal interest in this. Uh, I indeed, when I was Energy Minister, I ensured that the consents that were granted contain provisions to ensure that the fishing sector and the energy sector can work together. They are both great sectors of the Scottish economy. It's right that we do so. Where conflict arises, these cross-sectoral groups upon which Angus fishermen sit are a good way to resolve it, but the consultation that I'm engaged in at the moment is designed to ensure what further, uh, what further if anything, can be done to ensure that fishing interests are not prejudiced. After all, the fishermen were there first. Question number six, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it is taking to tackle population decline in rural areas. Mary Gusha. The Scottish Government recognises that people are Scotland's greatest asset and our economic action plan set out a commitment for a Come to Scotland campaign and along with our partners we're developing a package of measures to both attract people to and retain people in Scotland and that includes our rural areas. However, Scotland needs further levers to be able to action change and this includes having a tailored approach to migration that will attract and retain people with the skills we need to ensure the future sustainability of our rural communities. Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for that response. A community organisation in the Isle of Harris recently raised with me their concerns about the sustainability of having over 50% of homes in certain fragile communities given over to holiday houses. There is rightly a consensus that tourism uh, is important to the island economy, but what assessment has the Scottish Government made of this issue and what measures can be taken to ensure that communities do not become unsustainable, depopulated or unaffordable for people to live in? Mary Goodjohn. Thank you. I completely understand the concerns that have been raised by, by Alistair Allen. Uh, Scottish planning policy sets out that the planning system should be encouraging rural development that supports prosperous and sustainable communities and businesses. The Planning Scotland Bill was amended at stage two to include provision that any change of use from a residential property to a use for short-term holiday letting would be a material change of use which would then require planning permission. A further amendment to this section of the bill has been lodged in advance of stage three and the Scottish Government are considering the effect of the amendments and will respond to that in due course. Very quickly, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Statist and I refer member to my register of interest. Is the Minister concerned that the reduction in agricultural tenancies will also reduce impact, sorry, also reduce population levels in rural Scotland? Mary Gujon. Uh, thank the, the member for that question. I mean, there are, another, there are a number of reasons which, uh, where we're, why we're seeing a declining population in rural areas. And that's why I met with Migration Minister Ben McPherson recently to discuss this and to see what other uh, measures we could, we could be taking uh, to try and sustain and uh, build our populations in rural areas. I mean, throughout visits that I've made in my role, I, it's been a, a number of issues have been raised with me continually, particularly from young people and their ability to stay in rural areas and what we need is the connectivity we need the infrastructure we need the jobs we need the housing and it's by looking at all of these things in the round that we can hope to uh, not only maintain the populations that we have in rural areas but attract people to live in these areas as well question number seven peter chapman thank you deputy president officer i need to remind the, the uh, chamber of my register of interest as far as a farmer to ask the scottish government what plans it has to introduce an agricultural bill fair pursuing uh, in a recent parliamentary debate on future rural policy and support, I announced that we would introduce a rural support bill in this parliamentary session. This will enable us to amend retained EU law to deliver on the proposals for the period up to 2024, 
as set out in our stability and simplicity consultation. Consideration is currently being given to the timetable and I will of course advise Parliament of that once it has been agreed. <coughs> Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. An agricultural bill, as he knows, is essential for the Scottish Government to continue making support payments to our farmers post-Brexit. Last year's farm business income figures showed that over 60% of farms were making a loss, with the average farm business making a loss of 7,400 without additional support. More worryingly, LFA uh, sheep could farmers you come to the question, please, Mr. were making a loss of 27,400. So these figures show how vital Mr. Chapman, could you come are. to the question? So, with that in mind, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me when an agricultural bill will come to this Parliament? Fergus Hume. Well, we will bring it forward uh, uh, as necessary and in due course. But let me stress one simple point, Presiding Officer. Uh, this bill will cause no difficulty, will, we have no impediment to the continued payment of uh, monies due to farmers and crofters. That process is something which is a, a top priority for me and commands a great deal of my time and rightly so. The money is, is due to farmers and crofters uh, and the agricultural bill is simply a mechanism that allows us to continue to do that. I can give an absolute assurance today, as I have done repeatedly, that this bill is simply a lever that will allow us to do that and it will be brought forward in time to enable that to happen. Uh, with apologies to Claire Adamson that I didn't reach question eight, uh, that concludes portfolio questions.